The Demons of Galloway, Ireland. Let's plunge into a story so poignant and extraordinary that it defies belief. What you're about to discover is almost irreproachably historically accurate, but its horror borders on the inconceivable because of the heinous acts it reveals. No saga you have ever heard, however confidently told, can reveal the tale that is about to unfold before your eyes, nor can it expose in blood curdling detail in the depths of savage depravity to which a man bereft of the temporary influence of education and knowledge of the world can plunge. Who are these demons? And what sins have they committed? From the dark heart of Scotland, this story is not for the faint of heart. The start of one of Ireland's worst legends. In the mysteries of the past, where truth seems to mingle with legend, the birth of San Rebin remains a mystery shrouded in shadows. Some whispering the year of our Lord, 1390, others guessing as far back as 1500, during the reign of King James VI of Scotland. A native of the gloomy lands of East Lothian, just on the eastern edge of Hindenburg, Sanwin was born into a quadrille steeped in sinister rusticity. The son of a hedge cutter and a ditch digger, his destiny already seemed to be mapped out by his father's blades. But Sanwin, with his rebellious youth, had little patience for honest labor and, tormented by an insatiable wanderlust, took to the open sea, wandering as far as the wastelands outside his world, where he took as his companion a woman with a soul as dark as his own. At the age of 20, this young man finally decides to leave the town he hates so much, enjoying his destiny to that of Agnès Douglas, nicknamed Black Agnès the witch cursed in the eyes of the villagers. A woman tainted by darkness, she was rumored to be a follower of obscure devotions, warming the fringes of human sacrifice and celebrating her incantations to the devil at night. During their escapades, the sinister duo discovered a dark and menacing cave at Bananad Head, near Galloway. What started out as an insignificant quack in the cliff face turned out to be a cavern as vast as it was Lambert seen. The rising tide masked the opening, making this cave an impenetrable refuge for human eyes. They thought they had found a temporary shelter from the raging elements, but as the days turned into weeks, months and perhaps even years, the cave became their home. Struggling to survive, they fell into a spiral of mischief, theft, murder, and wars. While starvation was a daily occurrence, it was Agnès, the black hearted witch, who whispered a macabre proposal into Bin's ear. Survival can only be won at an exorbitant price. From now on, they would take their lives not for money or material goods, but to satisfy an unvariable hunger the hunger for the flesh of their fellow human beings. Swanyebin resolved to do the unthinkable and plunged into the abyss of depravity. Together, they set out to devour humanity itself. To keep the secret of their abominable fists, they artfully arranged the mutilated remains of their victims, presenting them to the world as a work of furious beasts. Our world now had a name, and it resounded in the bloody twilight of Galloway. Life in the cave. Once established in the depths of their sinister lair, the Rosleck couple move on to the next stage of their macabre world. Nestling in their cavern, they lie in wait for their prey, the unfortunate travelers who dare adventure onto their passes. To leave no trace, their victims were meticulously murdered, their bodies dragged to the hidden lair to be torn to pieces. Anonymous among the peasants of the region, the murderers disguise their monstrosity under the guise of ordinary citizens, spending the money of their unfortunate prey to stock up on goods, while jealously concealing any object that might compromise them within the confines of the cave. This despicable existence continued for years, weaving a web of horror across the region. A growing family. The infernal duo eventually gave birth one day to their first son, the first in a line that would continue for eight sons and six daughters. Raised on the cannibalistic teachings of their parents, who saw human flesh not just as a taboo but as a rite, a barbaric tradition fundamental to their morbid existence. 
they became predators, their puberty turning into a baptism of blood and flesh at the instigation of their demanded parents. Hunting both in wild packs and in small squads, they sued havoc in their efficiency. What's more, the key strategic location meant that they could avoid being discovered, as the rising tide left few traces. Thanks to this bloodthirsty method and the fact that they lived so far from the world, a long time went by without them being discovered. No one could guess how people who passed by got lost. After murdering a man, woman or child, they would take the corpses back to their cave, where they would dismember it and eat it. This was their only food, and although they had become so numerous, they generally had an excess of this disgusting food, so that under cover of the darkness of the night, they used to throw the remains of the unfortunate victims into the sea, trying to do at a great distance from the cave in which they lived. These bodies were often washed up on beaches in different parts of the region the amazement and horror of those who discovered them and those who heard of this macabre discovery. Disappearances. The disappearances followed one another with terrifying regularity spreading a wave of icy panic throughout the region. What had become of the friends who had disappeared, the relatives who had vanished. Worries and whisperers spread rumors that the region had been stricken by a devious curse with every world around more like a trap following in the naivety of workers. The king's scouts were dispatched to the region. Alas, many of them vanished into thin hair. While the lucky few were returned, among the living emerged weary and powerless in the face of the mystery shrouding their mission. Upright and honest men were captured and put on trial, hanged by the neck for no other reason than having come across some of the missing people. They were suspected of murdering these people in their establishments and then burying the corpses in places where they could not easily be discovered. The law was applied with the greatest severity imaginable to prevent such perfect and atrocious acts, so much so that many innkeepers living in the western part of Scotland, for fear of suffering the same fate, gave up their businesses and sought other occupations. The disappearances of the king's subjects continued without the perpetrators being discovered. On the scaffold, none of those executed admitted their guilt. On the contrary, they maintained their innocence right up to the last minute. The exact number of murderers committed by these savages has never been known, but it is estimated that during the 25 years of their misdeeds, they washed their hands in the blood of at least a thousand men women and children. Discovery of crimes. One day, Samnes family decided to attack a couple of Glasgow merchants. The man was armed, was able to defend himself and escaped. His wife, however, was not so lucky. During the battle, the poor woman fell from her horse and was immediately killed in front of her husband. Thorne's children pounced on the poor woman and subjected her to the worst punishment in front of her husband. On his horse, the merchant pursued the cannibals to save his wife, only to find part of her body strewn across the road. Terrorized and furious, the man set off in search of the authorities to help him find those responsible for his wife's death. The man, who was the first to escape alive from the ambush set by these monsters, tells the villagers what happened. They were all stunned and horrified by his story and the of the intention of the town magistrate, who immediately informed the king. Three or four days later, his majesty himself, with an army of 400 men, set off for the place where the tragedy had occurred, to search the ground, inch by inch, for those diabolical beings that had so long infested the western regions of the kingdom. The merchants who had been attacked acted as guide and a large number of hunting dogs were also taken along. Their initial search provided fruitless. They found no dwelling and also they passed the cave, they paid no attention to it and continued their search along the beach. Fortunately, as the tide was low at the time, some dogs entered the cave and immediately a terrible concert of barking, howling, and growling was heard. So that the king and his attendants retraced their steps and examined the entrance of the cave, not believing that a man could be hidden in a place where only darkness could be seen. 
But when they saw that the dog's cries were increasing and that they refused to leave the cave, they began to think that a beast might be living there. So they set off, torches in hand, a large group of men venturing into the cave, through the most intricate twists and turns, until they finally reached the remote cavity that served as the dwelling place for this diabolical being. The cave. This part of the story may disturb the sensitivity of some. Last warning if you really want to continue. Because the spectacle which presented itself to the eyes of the soldiers was such that none of them could forget it as long as they would live. Legs, arms, hands and feet of men, women and children were hung on rocks and left to dry. There were many pickled limbs and a large quantity of gold and silver coins, watches, rings, swords, clothing of all kinds and many other articles that belonged to the murdered people. Saunet's family then consisted of himself, his wife, eight sons, six daughters, and as the incestuous fruits of all this little brotherhood, 18 grandsons and 14 granddaughters. All were chained by order of his majesty. The soldiers collected whatever human remains they could find and buried them in the sand. They then loaded up the loot the murderers had collected and returned to Enderbrog with their prisoners. Saunet Bean and his family were not tried for their crimes, as it was deemed unnecessary to try beings who had proven themselves to be sworn enemies of humanity. The men were dismembered, arms and legs amputated, and left to hemorrhage. Their wives, daughters and grandchildren were burned in three separate piles, but first they were hung on stakes and left alive, for a time to watch the massacre of the clan members. All the diabolical beings died without the sightless sign of repentance. On the contrary, as long as they had the breeze of life, they uttered the most terrible curses and blasphemy. Legend has it that Sonne Bean kept repeating It's not over, it'll never end. In total, the Bean clan founded through incest had 48 members. It is believed that more than a thousand people were killed by the family of cannibals. Today, a cliff on the Scottish coast leads to the cave where the Bean family lived, and although more than 600 years have passed, no one dares to enter.